This episode is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association, organizers of the 22nd annual Learn to Homebrew Day, coming up on Saturday, November 7th. Learn to Homebrew Day is an opportunity to celebrate and spread the joy of one of the most rewarding and delicious activities of all time. Pledge to brew this November 7th and receive a promo code for $5 off a one-year American Homebrewers Association membership. Visit homebrewersassociation.org to learn more. homebrewersassociation.org Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, October 8th, 2020. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, mad fermentationist and founder of Sapwood Cellars, Mike Tonsmeyer, joins us to talk about English Imperial Stout. Mike goes back to the roots of the Imperial style to brew some thick and delicious beers. If you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. And if you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other basic brewing gear. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, at Basic Brewing, and find our show page on Facebook as well. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing, and thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. Well, the year 2020 continues to fill with bad news. We heard earlier this week of the passing of Mike Tasty McDole, who, through his work at the Brewing Network, added a tremendous amount to our brewing knowledge and was a heck of a nice guy on top of that. Uh, I didn't know Tasty well, but I did get to spend some time hanging out with him in New Zealand at uh, the first uh, New Zealand homebrew conference. We Americans, including Tasty, John Palmer, Chris Colby, and Andy Sparks, took part in panels, uh, toured hop production facilities, and even brewed batches of beer in front of a crowd. Mike Tasty McDole, welcome to welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. You've been, we talked to, I talked to you during the long shot uh, yeah, competition so, thing, yeah. long, oh, long, long time, time ago. ago. Yeah, yeah. Basic Basic Brewing Radio was really basic then. I bet. <laughs> Look <laughs> at you now. It's a, it's a, so elaborate. This uh, <laughs> equipment you got is just amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here with here with my one microphone, my one uh, recorder. Um, it's good to spend. Some, I was telling John that it's good to spend some time with you guys. We see in passing at the oh, uh, at yeah, the events. Yeah, yeah. then we're uh, really busy. If like you see me like at the National Home Brewers Conference, I'm like all over the place. Like you know, sometimes I just want to go in the corner and like be by myself. Yeah, yeah. It's not a good time sometimes. I mean, it's it's great. I love it. I love the you know, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand home brewers in one place. Can't be any more fun than that. And all and I, all of them want a picture with you. So. I do a lot of pictures. <laughs> I had a lot of pictures here today. Yeah, for so, sure. So, what do you got? What do you got brewing here? And, well, and, and, um, I, and let me say that I'm not much intimidated brewing right next to you here. No, it's, <laughs> it's no big deal. This is your basic IPA. It's uh, be about six point two percent. The uh, we're using obviously the domestic New Zealand hops here. I'm using uh, their Chinook and their Cascade primarily, just so I can sort of like, you know, well, I, I probably won't get to have the beer though. It'd be nice if they sent us a case. <laughs> Uh, but I'd like to see how it would compare to like our hops. You, you know, make it very. So I'm very familiar with this sort of like malt profile, so I, you know, it'd be a pretty good comparison. Talk about the malt profile. Well, it's uh, I'm using uh, about uh, 70, 85 percent, uh, about 80 uh, percent pale malt, New Zealand pale malt from uh, landfill, and then about uh, 14 percent uh, their Pilsner malt. And then about, uh, I think it's like 4% crystal, they call it light crystal. Probably looks like it's like our crystal 40 or English 45. And then about 4% is sigillated malt, I'm trying to get the drinking pH down uh, kind of low. What's your hop strategy? I mean, how, when are you going to, the, the weighted percentages of where you're going to add the hops, essentially? Well, uh, this beer is going to be about, uh, uh, starting gravity about uh, 1058, so... You know, I do kind of like a, a beer like this. I'll do like a like a one to one. Like, I mean, then that calls for like 58 IBUs, right? So I'll do half of that at, at, as a uh, 60 minute edition, and then the uh, other half, like 10 minutes in later. Mike McDowell leaves the world more tasty through his legacy. 
How many times this year have I had to transition from horrible news back to the flow of the show? It's always clumsy, and um, I wish I knew how to do it better, frankly. Uh, But the good news is that there is not much left of 2020. Before I forget again, Steve and I are planning to do our annual disaster show at the end of the year. I'm already getting disaster stories coming in, and I don't know yet when we'll record the show. So get your story in to james at basicbrewing.com, and uh, I'll be rustling up some prizes at some point in the proceedings. So uh, turn your bad news into good news. Speaking of good news, Ricky from uh, Groenfeld Meadery says they're adding two states to their distribution West Virginia and, drumroll, Arkansas. I was stunned when I heard that, but uh, Ricky says Groenfell is one of a few producers able to ship to my home state because of a small change in legislation. And Ricky says that he and Kelly should have more, three more states to announce in the next few weeks. You know, we love Groenfell and Chaos Meads. They are moderate gravity, most are carbonated, which makes them extremely drinkable, and of course, they're delicious. And now you can build your own variety case and automatically get 10% off and free shipping to your house. Uh, there are also mead homebrew recipes if you want to brew your own at growandfell.com and, and see what goes into their meads. Follow them on Facebook and Instagram to see the latest info uh, because, you know, sometimes they have pre-releases and they go fast. So you can get delicious craft mead shipped to even more places on growenfell.com. That's G-R-O-E-N-N-F-E-L-L. I did a bit of benchmarking this past weekend. You know, I made my own mango hard seltzer, and we'll have a video episode later this month on that. Well, I decided to buy some mango white claw to see how mine measured up to a commercial example. And I feel a whole lot better about my homebrew example now. <laughs> I don't want to get too negative, but, um, man, how do you drink that stuff? It's uh, If all commercial hard seltzers uh, taste that way, you uh, you need to make your own to save your friends and relatives from that fate, uh, because it, it can be done better. Uh, in uh, let's, Enough slamming uh, somebody else. Let's take a look into the mailbag. Ralph from Gainesville, Florida, writes after hearing Adam Ross talking about Dumpf beer and tapache. Ralph says, I listened to your latest episode of Basic Brewing Radio this morning when you talked with Adam Ross. Just by pure coincidence, I have a keg of of Dumpf beer on tap right now. The source I used was in the style spotlight from the November-December 2013 issue of Zymergy. I I missed that one. Either that or I read it and forgot it. Uh, I used 65% Pils malt with 35% Munich malt and a one-ounce edition of Carafa 1 for some color. A single edition of Tradition Hops at 60 minutes and fermented at 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Turned out to be a nice summer drink with notes of banana and clove. Uh, Ralph says, I named it Wesley's Wheatless Weissbeer, after my brew buddy and dog, Wesley. Aw, good dog, Wesley. Thanks, Ralph. I appreciate that. Uh, co- co- not coincidentally, it happened on purpose. Yesterday, I brewed my own attempt uh, at a dump beer uh, using 10 pounds or 4.5 kilograms of 10 Lovabon Munich, 1 pound or 450 grams of 20 Lovabon Munich, and uh, an ounce of Hollertau middle fruit hops uh, just for bittering at 60 minutes. And I did a no chill. And today, I'm going to pitch uh, G01 Stefan from our friends and sponsors at uh, Imperial Organic Yeast. Uh, Stefan is a Hefeweizen yeast, so I'm hoping uh, it will bring out a delicious banana and clove character in my Dampf beer. Uh, I've, I've also added a new recipe to our recipe section on basicbrewing.com using Stefan. It's Gary's Hefeweizen from Gary Batliner at Imperial. Gary is in charge of growing the yeast at Imperial, so he's an important guy. Uh, His recipe uses a three-step mash and features red wheat, Pilsner malt, uh, with a little rye. Gary says he thinks the rye plays well with the uh, clove notes from the Imperial Stefan yeast. Uh, So now our recipe section has doubled in size, (laughs) meaning we got two now. Uh, Check it out at basicbrewing.com slash recipes. 
Uh, we love Imperial Organic Yeast. My stir plate is dusty because I don't make starters for standard gravity five-gallon batches. Uh, and at a pitch rate of 200 billion cells in each of those easy-to-open pouches, it's no wonder. Ask your local homebrew store for Imperial Organic Yeast or head over to imperialyeast.com. We also heard through the mailbag of some commercial examples of tapache, which is that uh, naturally fermented uh, uh, pineapple drink that Adam talked about. Thomas writes in and says, Arcus Cidery outside of Austin has released Tapache in the past. Uh, and Alan from Tacoma, but now living in Missouri, says Dos Luces, gluten-free brewing in Denver, has done a Tapache as well as Chicha and Pulque. And uh, Alan says he met uh, the uh, Dos Luces brewer at GABF back in happier times and that their beers were pretty great according to Alan. So I uh, appreciate that. And thanks, everybody, for the info. It's always good when uh, we hear uh, from, from, from listeners out there with uh, more info than we have. Uh, speaking of tasty beers, our sponsors Desiree and Dave from High Gravity in Tulsa have released a new kit, Solid AF Citra Pale Ale. I'm assuming uh, AF stands for Awesomely Flavorful. <laughs> this is a beer... That apparently is a favorite at Pippin's Tap Room, but now you can brew it yourself in your own dang house. It's the first of High Gravity's Essential Hop Series. The beer has all the things, Desiree and Dave say, citrus, grapefruit, lime, tropical fruits, and just the right amount of bitterness. Solid AF Citra Pale Ale. On HighGravityBrew.com, you can get uh, extract or all grain. And don't forget to check out the winter and holiday kit selections because if you buy more than one ingredient kit, you get a 10% discount applied at checkout. And, of course, if you have your own recipe, you can use the super handy Build Your Own Beer page on HighGravityBrew.com. And, of course, you can take a couple extra minutes to drool over their electric brewing gear, too. You know we love Desiree and Dave. They take the pain out of propane at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. Okay, it's been way too long since I've talked to Mike Tonsmeyer of Sapwood Cellars. I checked his Mad Fermentationist blog to see what he's been up to and got thirsty reading about what he calls English Imperial Stout. Mike Tonsmeyer, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. My pleasure as always, James. It's been a long time. I've talked to your uh, partner, Scott, more than I've talked to you lately. Yeah, I think Skype told me I, I hadn't had a uh, call with you since March 2019, so I, 18 months is a, a long time for us to go without catching up anyway. That's crazy. <laughs> uh, there, was there a homebrew conference between here and uh, here and there, or, 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 or am I th – things are – for some reason, uh, you know, all the time uh, mileposts are, 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 are confused in my head. I don't know what day it is. I don't know what month it is. All I know is I'm still at home, so I. Can... <laughs> yeah, you're 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 right though, because we we got together and uh, chatted at uh, a home homebrew con uh, in um, Providence, Rhode Island, a couple of months after that, but still more more than a year ago. Right. Okay. Well, it's 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 time. It's time that we got together. Uh, I went on your blog and and I said I hadn't talked to Mike in a while. Let's see what he's been up to. Uh, and I saw a post way back from May. Was it May? Yeah. Which which is also disturbingly the most recent post on my blog. Uh, but <laughs> lets you know how much less time I have to write now that I work at a brewery than when I was at a, uh, a desk job nine to five. <laughs> yeah. 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 Now that you're not, you know, working for the federal government, you know, writing uh, your blog at, uh, you know, at your desk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a joke. I'm sure for any, anybody listening, just a joke. Uh, so you you've been busy. How are how are things at uh, Sapwood Cellars? Uh, really, really good. Um, we were we were lucky with um, the size we were and and where we were when the the whole uh, you know shutdown and and quarantine and pandemic thing hit. But um, we've sort of pivoted to mostly canning beer. Um, but as the tasting room is reopening and and whatever, we're actually going through a little bit of an expansion to add some more capacity so we can have um, cans to go, but also have some some draft for in-house. And um, our sour program and our bottles are still um, churning along. Uh, it took took a little while to get going, but we've uh, 
have a release every three or four weeks uh, for the most part. We just did a um, honey saison in uh, white wine barrels was the most recent one. Wow. And uh, are, are things going along according to the business plan or is or has this uh, kind of knocked you in a different direction? Um, it's similar to the business plan. We had actually attempted to order new tanks uh, last December and uh, whether it was a result of um, – them coming from China and 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 COVID, uh, but they were uh, lost in transit or never shipped or something happened, and we ended up having to reorder um, a couple of months ago. So that that delayed us a little bit, but um, honestly, it worked out fine. We really didn't need that extra capacity um, for the first half of the year, um, and so we're we're uh, my my brewer Ken is actually back there right now, going through the passivation steps on the new tanks, and uh, we'll be brewing into one of them on. Friday, hopefully, a, a hoppy lager with uh, our friends over at Astro Lab in Silver Spring. Wow! And you're you're expanding not only in equipment but also in space and real estate as well. Yeah, we've got um, sort of three units in this office park we're in now, and we're we just signed a lease for a fourth unit. I wish it was right next to us, but it's it's uh, one more unit down. We have M and O, and this is uh, K rather than L, sadly. Um, so it'll be a little bit of a pain. Uh, moving all of our barrels and all of our sour beer gear to this um, extra unit, but we're we're uh, it's probably nice to have a little bit more physical separation. You know, keep keep those microbes uh, and all their uh, associated equipment as far away from our um, clean beers as possible. <laughs> You're gonna have to have like a like a scrub zone between uh, <laughs> between yeah, the one so place and another. Our uh, friends of ours have a brewery, and they they have a policy that if you go over there, you're going home for the night after you go. And they've got little uh, booty dispensers, and they've got uh, little drip trays that you have to step in sanitizer before before coming back out. We'll we'll see if we're that paranoid, but um, <laughs> so so far so good. We've been open two years and haven't had any uh, cross contamination issues or anything like that. Just need to rewatch uh, the Andromeda Strain yeah. and get some ideas. <laughs> not not sure that's the best thing to watch right now, but yeah, that's, oh, that's true. <laughs> I was thinking of changing clothes and uh, different colored, yeah. uh, you know, coveralls and things like that for clean, different clean areas. Clean room, and, and yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't think about the whole uh, premise of the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, so, so the the post that I saw was on the title of it uh, caught my attention. English imperial stouts. You know, we're used to hearing about Russian imperial stouts, but uh, what the heck is an English imperial stout? Yeah, so I mean, really what I was trying to get across was that, you know, I think Russian imperial stout has now become a much more um, generic term for big, roasty stouts. Um, and some people are just calling them imperial stouts. Some people say, still say Russian imperial stout. But this was me hearkening back to the original versions that were brewed in England for export to um, the the Russian imperial court. Um, and, you know, sort of the, the grandfather of all the imperial stouts, uh, but, you know, a, a tradition that mostly died out in England uh, and was, you know, sort of as many styles have been revived by American craft brewers. And what's the difference? I mean, how ha how have we strayed away from that original example? Sure. I mean, I, I think um, I mean, particularly now uh, when we brew a sort of standard imperial stout, uh, it is uh, really roasty and it probably has some darker crystal malts in it, maybe Special B, maybe Crystal 120, you know, that big dark fruit kind of flavor. Um, we're certainly pushing uh, the, the final gravities up. I mean, I think people um, across the board are really responding to um, beers that have a little bit more of a, a sweet flavor. Um, and so uh, for our, our sort of standard, uh, we have a beer called Time Stream on now that started at about 1, 125 and finishes at about 10, 48, I think. Um, <laughs> and that's, um, it's, I mean, it's 10.3% alcohol. So, I mean, it's, it's a big beer, but it's, it's not massive. Um, but when you have a beer that has, uh, and that one has, I think pretty close to maybe 15% um, dark malts between a lot of carafe special, but then also some roasted barley and some chocolate malts. Um, and when you have that much roast, um, you know, it's, it's like uh, coffee with, uh, with a couple of sugars in it, that that sweetness helps to um, round it out. Um, it really makes it um, a friendly beer for adjuncts. Um, 
you know, we, we're working on a banana peanut butter version of it. We've mm. done coconut vanilla. We've done uh, bar- bourbon barrel aged coffee. We've done the Mexican hot chocolate kind of idea with um, chili peppers and cacao nibs and cinnamon and vanilla. Um, and, and for us, I mean, you know, whether you want to call that a pastry stout or or just sort of a, a flavored imperial stout, you know, they it's it's a base that's really roasty, toasty, sweet, um, you know, layers of flavor. Um, in a lot of cases, uh, uh, can be you know a decent amount of bitterness from hops. Uh, versus that classic English was a much sort of um, cleaner, simpler beer. Um, you know, going back into the the 19th century, there weren't a lot of crystal malts. There wasn't a you know, I mean, we just have so many maltsters now, and so many uh, different choices on malts and specialty malts and whatever. Um, but you know, those those historic stouts and porters were, um, you know, pale malt, amber, brown, and black, and and that's about it. Maybe some um, uh, caramelized sugar, um, whether in sort of more traditionally like a a brewer's uh, caramel four or whatever it is. But uh, we all often use uh, candy syrup just because that's a, a relatively easy and um, somewhat similar product. Hmm. Now, the, these beers, you know, finishing it out at like 1050, 1048, 1050, yeah. you know, they're, they're, so, they're so chunky you want to eat them with a fork, but you use a spoon to get every bite. But uh, um, so <laughs> so I mean, someone recently called that beer as a, a, a knife, knife and fork beer. <laughs> you want to have pancakes. Uh, but you, but you got to think, though, that with all the alcohol uh, that it, it, it doesn't. Does it taste that thick? I mean, surely it doesn't. Uh, I mean, it's almost like a hot scotchy. Yeah, no, it, we, we, it's surprising the number. Of, and, and I don't put a huge amount of, uh, of stock in what people on Untapped say because – and we could, we could talk about that sometime, but there, <laughs> there are some, some uh, swings and misses. Um, but the number of people who say, hey, our particular version is you know, sweet, but it's not, it's not sticky sweet or syrupy sweet um, – you know, if we've filled, uh, you know, five cases worth of crowlers of it. I can tell you it's sticky. I mean, your fingers will start <laughs> being glued together. Your gloves will be tacky um, by the end of it. But, yeah, exactly. And that's sort of the idea that um, the sweetness is in balance with, um, you know, the alcohol, the roast, the hot bitterness. Um, and the more you want to push those things, um, the, the more the sweetness comes up. And that's what we found with, with IPAs and double IPAs too, is we, we tend to be a little bit more bitter than a lot of other breweries are with their hazy, um, juicy New England IPAs. And uh, because we're adding more hops on the hot side and more bitterness, we're also ending up um, pushing that final gravity up up into the 1020s just to um, balance it out. I used to get uh, questions uh, back in the day from brewers who said, oh, my beer finished at, you know, X uh, finishing uh, gravity. Uh, is it stuck? Is my fermentation stuck? And one of the questions that I learned to ask was, well, what was your starting gravity? You know, because yeah. if you start at, you know, 1080 or 1100 and you get down to like, you know, 1020, um, your debt's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. And, and really, in the end, I mean, the, the question should be, how does it taste? Mm-hmm. Um, I wouldn't be too worried about um, what the numbers say unless the answer is, yeah, it's too sweet. Then we can think about drying it out. But if it is, and we've, we've had some lower gravity stouts that have stopped a little higher than we would have expected. And, hey, as, as a 5% beer instead of a 5.5% beer, it's still delicious. And there's no sense in um, jumping through a bunch of hoops to get to exactly that, uh, that final gravity that you had um, put into the recipe before you brewed it. Um, you know, and, and but might maybe worth thinking about tweaking things in the future, whether that's to keep the, the gravity that high or whether it's to drive it down a little bit further. And what do you do as far as yeast health or, uh, you know, taking care of the yeast or pitching the yeast to, to make sure that you are actually hitting the, you know, the that you're not actually getting a stuck fermentation or you are actually finishing as low as you want? Yeah, it really depends on exactly what we're trying to do. For for the English Imperial Stouts, we keep a um, English strain, you know, in in the neighborhood of a a, a thirteen eighteen, a Boddington's, a, a London Fog, a, you know, whatever you want to call it. That's what we use for our um, primary fermentation on our pale ales and our IPAs. And so we'll just harvest from um, hopefully whatever low alcohol beer we're brewing, um, and pitch a whole lot of cells into uh, the stout. Um, 
And then on top of that, um, as, as a, a brewery, we have uh, inline aeration. So as the wort uh, exits the heat exchanger, it goes through um, a tube that has um, a, a stone in it. And we can just pump in um, oxygen uh, for the whole knockout, part of the knockout, at whatever rate we choose. Let's take a quick break from talking to Mike to talk about our friends and sponsors at Tavor. If you listen to this show, you know about Tavor. It's a way to select delicious craft beers that you may not be able to find in your area and have them delivered to you. It's not a beer of the month club where someone chooses beer for you. You only pay for the beer that you choose over the course of the month. Signing up for Tavor is free. Just create an account at Tavor.com, T-A-V is in Victor, O-U-R.com, and download their iPhone or Android app. You'll receive notifications for two new beers each day that are available for purchase with in-depth tasting notes. This month, look for selections from Oliphant, Human Robot, Wild State Cider, B-52, and Union Craft. If you're not interested in the beers that you see, no worries. Just click the one or skip the ones that you don't want. Uh, however, when you do see something that you do want, don't wait. Just click on it and add it to your crate. Your beer arrives fresh every few weeks, allowing you enough time to fill a box and pay the least shipping. Why don't you check it out? It doesn't cost anything to sign up. There's no obligation to purchase anything. In fact, if I can ask you a favor, go to Tavor.com, T-A-V as in Victor, O-U-R.com. Or download the app, and when you sign up, enter the promo code BASICBREWING, all one word, and you get 10 bucks off your first shipment of $25 or more. It's, again, uh, it's free to sign up, and there's no obligation to purchase. Sign up at Tavor.com or with the Tavor app and enter Basic Brewing as the promo code. Let's talk about the recipe uh, on your website here, the Courage Russian Imperial Stout Clone. And is that is that the recipe that you've basically been using to you know as a springboard on the re- on the stouts that you've been brewing there? Yeah, no, and I um, I did two different versions of it um, at home. Um, uh, my uh, good friend James, not not you, James, different James, <laughs> uh, and I brewed it. I, I'm going to say 12 or 13 years ago now for the first time, um, and it was really um, a little bit based on sort of the concept of it, but I also talked to um, Ron Pattinson uh, of uh, Shut Up About Bar- Barclay Perkins, and he sent me a, I would have to find the, the the exact year, but it was like a 1937 brew sheet from um, what was called the catchy name IBS, Imperial Brown Stout, hmm. uh, when it was, because that was after Carge had been bought out. Um so that was when it was it was Barclay uh, at that point had had sort of taken over for for them. Um, and so he sent that to me and that was sort of um, that, that had a little bit more brown malt than sort of the original version I had brewed and um, had some other tweaks. And so the second version I did was a lot more sort of inspired by that that real historic version. Um, but you know, as, as some things go, the, the most authentic version is not necessarily the best version. I really like that first one I did that had a little bit less brown malt, a little brown malt can be a little bit acrid, a little bit, um, uh, too assertive when you've got a lot of roast and a lot of, of other flavors going on. So I actually, for the version we did at Sapwood basically went back to that original, um, recipe other than rounding a little bit different, you know, not uh, using 45 pounds of uh, amber malt from a sack, using the whole 55 pounds, that that kind of thing. But mm. um, otherwise, it was very similar. Um, yeah, it's uh, the I think the only other thing we may have changed, we've found that uh, a lot of the English malts, when you really start pushing the um, other grains that are in there just don't have quite enough um, uh, diastatic oomph to do a great conversion. So often we'll, we'll add 10, 15, 20% American pale two row um, just to make sure that there's enough enzymes in there to deal with the amber malt, the brown malt, um, which may not be exactly the same as the amber and the brown malt that were made um, 75, 150 years ago. This recipe that I'm looking at has a golden promise Maris otter, amber malt, dark candy sugar syrup, black patent malt, and uh, corn sugar and brown malt. Uh, yep. And in talking to uh, Peter Simons about, you know, these historical, 
you know, English uh, beers and, uh, you know, the Australian beers that were uh, based on those, you know, they weren't they weren't shy about using sugar. Yeah. No. And, and particularly. Um, uh, oh, what's his name? He's from um, Zebulon Artisan Ales. Uh, Mike Karnowski, have you talked to him? No. He's he's terrific. He he runs a little brewery down uh, in Asheville, and he loves historic beers, and he makes his own um, caramels. Ah. And so he's talked about doing that. You know that the caramels that you have to add. Um, I think you often add a little citric acid to invert them, and then you cook them for four or five hours, and you just slowly keep adding a little bit of water so the temperature doesn't get too high, but you can keep getting these. Uh, caramelization reactions um, and he does his his historic steps with that I, I, so far I have been too lazy to to attempt uh, <laughs> something like that um, but that's that sort of um, candy syrup is is a is made in a different way um, candy syrup is a generally a Maillard reaction um, so they're actually adding um, a source of nitrogen whether that's just unrefined uh, beet sugar or whether that might be um, people at home uh, use like e- even uh, we were talking about DAP uh, mm-hmm. yeast nutrient mm-hmm. um, is a great source of uh, nitrogen and can be used to um, create those sorts of flavors. Um, it happens much faster, um, and there are different compounds created than a pure caramelization. Um, but in a lot of cases, you're getting some of the same kinds of darker um, caramel, maybe some fruit flavors, maybe some um, uh, slightly you know uh, toffee burnt kind of uh, flavors as well. Yeah, Steve and but, I. Yeah. Steve and I attempted to uh, make uh, Belgian candy syrup on uh, one video podcast, and and we made something, and yeah. it was <laughs> it was real thick, uh, but you know it. We put it in the beer, and it and it fermented and tasted good. Uh, so you know you can be you can be forgiven uh, that you don't want to experiment with that. It's a messy, you know, and potentially dangerous process. You know, hot sugar is is yeah. uh, not fun to play with. Um, and 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 like I, I've done a pound or two at home for for experiments, but it's another one to try to come up with fifty or a hundred pounds of something like that. You know, oh, that's yeah, uh, uh, yeah as, as you said, uh, messy and dangerous, and and particularly if it doesn't turn out well, or or even if it does turn out well as a commercial brewery, it's you'd like to have uh, consistency. And you know, if if cooking it a little bit longer, a little bit hotter, a little bit. Uh, differently doesn't yield the same results and you go to brew the beer again in a year and and the 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 result is totally different that's certainly not a a helpful thing so uh, typically or or a lot of times when people add sugar uh, to a recipe like when you add you know some sucrose to a, a you know like a double IPA mm-hmm. you're wanting it you're wanting it to dry out you're wanting to dry out the beer uh, but i take it that that in this recipe, does the sugar have the same effect? I mean, if you if you didn't add the uh, add the sugar and you added some other kind of you know fermentables of the same weight, uh, how how do you think that that would af- affect things? Yeah, I mean, I think it certainly does help to dry it out. Um, I and mean, we're certainly mashing when we are adding sugar like that. We're mashing a little bit warmer than we would otherwise. Um, these beers start so big and and still finish big, and so. Um, for for more of the English, and so we we call ours uh, uh, Lord uh, Rupert Everton, which is uh, a reference to to the Office. Uh, it's the the wacky character Michael Scott, sort of his English oh. alter ego. <laughs> um, uh, it finishes in the mid ten twenties. Um, I would have to look exactly ten twenty six, ten twenty eight, something like that. So it's it's certainly on the drier side of um, these big dark beers that we do. Um, partly because it isn't as roasty. It's not uh, uh, especially um, strongly bittered. Um, and so it doesn't need quite as much sweetness to kind of balance out those um, those other flavors. I just did, uh, I brewed up uh, the next malt sampler uh, yesterday, comparing um, Black Patent against uh, Black Prins and mm-hmm. Midnight Wheat. Mm-hmm. Um, and there are a lot of misconceptions about uh, Black Patent uh, you know, a lot of people think uh, black patent is acrid, or you know, is ashy, or yeah. But, but what do you what do you find that it brings to the beers? Um, you know, I think what people are often tasting when they taste those things is tasting the low pH. Um, when you add uh, a lot of dark malt, uh, you really need to um, both both for you know getting good conversion, but then also the the flavor of the finished beer. Um, you know, adding. Um, chalk can work, although it's not especially effective. Um, we use um, baking soda in a lot of our beers in the mash, 
And then if the boil uh, pH drops further than, the, than we want, we'll add chalk at that point. Um, and then in the really big, really roasty ones, we'll add uh, slaked lime, uh, pickling lime. And that's a very effective way to uh, raise the pH without um, adding a lot of excess sodium. If you're already, you have enough sodium for flavor. I like 50 or 75 parts per million of sodium in my dark beers um, if they're going to be a little sweeter. Um, but uh, with some of these sort of over the top beers, it would, you know, would probably be at 150 or 200 parts per million of sodium, you know, almost tasting like a. Uh, Probably not quite to Goza levels, but not too far off of that. Hmm. Um, and so Black Patent to me is, has just like a really nice chocolatey, rounded, um, you know, it, it certainly has a little bit of char to it, but it's definitely not um, ashy or or anything like that. Um, and, and having enough sweetness to back it up, too, again, helps to alleviate that if you're sensitive to, you know, espresso or black coffee, um, you know, a little of that, but with... Um, uh, with some sugar behind it can, can be nice and can be a good, good counterpoint to, um, that sweetness. So to the base beer, you've been playing with, uh, doing things like a barrel aging and adding Brett as well. Yeah, there's, I mean, certainly most beers that were being brewed 150 or 200 years ago, if it was going into Oak, it was going to get, you know, they used to say stale, but not stale in the sense of stale bread, just stale in the sense of, um, a, an aged vinous, um, you know, richer flavor. Uh, and so for the very first version of the beer, I just added, um, some oak cubes. And then, uh, it was right around the time that Y yeast was discontinuing, uh, Britannomyces anomalous. Um, it, it turned out, I think they'd gotten it tested. It was really Britannomyces bruxellensis. And again, you know, in 2000, what was this? 2007, uh, you know, I guess they just didn't feel that there was a need to have another Brett Brock strain that has slightly different um, flavor profile. So they discontinued it, but my local homebrew uh, store uh, knew that I liked Brett and said, hey, you know, I've got a pack of this. They're discontinuing it if you want to play with it. Um, I did a 100% Brett beer. And I, I add some to this. Um, and I really liked it. It was a relatively subtle flavor, but gave it just a little sort of leathery, vinous, aged kind of thing. Um, but I got nervous that it was going to dry out too much. And mm. so I ended up, um, finding it with gelatin and transferring it and adding some Campton tablets, some med metabisulfite to stop the bread. Ah. Um, and surprisingly it worked. It, it knocked the bread down far enough that, um, even in the bottle for, I just opened the very last bottle of it. Um, when I wrote that article a couple of months ago at, at, you know, more than 12 years in the bottle, it still tasted great. It never got over carbonated. It stopped at about 10, 20, um, and yeah, worked worked out beautifully. Hmm. Um, so that that had been uh, discontinued, and then uh, a couple years later, when I went to brew the um, the the rebrew at home, I had an old bottle of that 100% Brett beer, and I tried to grow it up, and it didn't really work. Uh, and I ended up using uh, Brett C, Brett Klosenii, um, and it was a little more aggressive. It was a little funkier. I thought it clashed a little bit. Um, cause again, I mean, this isn't a super roasty beer, but, um, just roast and funk is, is a, can be a tricky balance. The phenolic thing with the roast, the drier thing with the roast. Um, and so when we, uh, brewed a version or version of it at Sapwood, uh, the idea was to keg off about half the batch, you know, maybe 10 kegs of it plain as is no bread, no wood. Um, and then we, uh, got a couple of, I think they're about 80 gallon barrels from, uh, Sagamore spirits in Baltimore. And they had originally been cognac barrels that then they'd done a cognac finished rye whiskey in. Um, so we got those and then, um, I decided, Hey, I'm a professional brewery now. I'm going to email Y East and see, you know, I'm, I'm sure they can just give me, uh, uh, you know, for a couple hundred bucks, a commercial pitch of the bread a, uh, and they said, Nope. We don't sell it anymore. We we destroyed our stock of it. It's gone. Wow. Uh, and so I posted on, um, you know, some of the American Homebrewing Association forums on yeast wrangling and on Milk the Funk and eventually got directed to a guy in France named uh, Chris, Chris, uh, Christophe uh, Pinchon, uh, who is sort of a, a, a fantastic and wonderful resource for microbes. Uh, he stockpiles them um and we'd used uh, a friend of a friend had given us uh, a a brett strain he'd harvested from a berliner weiss that we used and had great results with so i emailed him and he 
checked his stock and and uh, luckily for us had it and um, you know grew it up and tested us uh, tested it and and sent a sample our way and uh, just recently I sent him back uh, some of the finished beer and then sort of another selection of, of our beers as a thank you for uh, for sending it Wow uh, but oddly it the the culture he sent started right up it really um, you know the the starter looked great and I pitched about a liter of it into each of the two barrels and it didn't do much. Um, it didn't really lower the gravity. And, um, I think that there is a little Brett flavor, but I, it's debatable. Some Hmm. people, my tasting room manager, Spencer, whose palate I really trust said, yep, I get Brett right, right off the top. And then, um, some other people have said, no, you know, it just tastes, tastes like a barrel aged stout to me. Um, and so whether it was, you know, that the strain maybe had lost its ability to ferment more complex sugars or, or what over, you know, 12 years in storage. Um, I don't know, but, um, we were still very happy with the beer, but it, it definitely was not, um, as, uh, funky bready as the, uh, the original version I'd brewed. Huh. Well, that's, that's kind of sad that, uh, uh, you know, hopefully that's not something that's just disappeared, <laughs> yeah, and that's 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 the trick, and that's I mean I I've never understood. I, I always appreciate when uh, yeast labs uh, learn something new about a strain, but it doesn't stop them from selling it. You know, it, just because um, uh, Brett Twa from White Labs uh, turned out not to be Britannomyces, it still makes great beer, and now they sell it as Saccharomyces Twa. That's mm. fine. You know, it, 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 to me, it doesn't really matter what the classification of something is. That you know, does it make good beer? Do I want to use it? Kind of is irrelevant to is it technically an ale or a lager strain or is it Britannomyces or you know something else yeah especially in these days of uh, all these quote-unquote new uh, you know like of Ike strains <laughs> that have been around for hundreds of years and hang, yeah. hanging in people's barns with you know bird poop on them and <laughs> uh, and you know they're they're starting to be shared everywhere um, you know it's good to it's good to keep track of, of what's what but uh, yeah you know but to, to use that as a tool for, you know, oh, well, it's not Britannomyces. Maybe I feel more comfortable with it in my uh, my clean fermenters. But in the same breath, well, maybe this strain is diastaticus. And, and even if it's a uh, a brewer's yeast, it's uh, Saccharomyces diastaticus. Maybe I don't want it in my clean beer. Maybe it's safer with the sour beer if it's, you know, uh, could could have the same effect as Brett, even if it's not Brett. I think it, I think it was you who sent us the first... 100% Brett beer that we tried. Uh, Could have been. It was, that was, I think we did like a, like a weird fermentations or something where I'd mixed kombucha with something and maybe had a hundred percent Brett beer. And, and, th- and that beer was super clean. We were amazed at how super clean it was. Yeah. Um, and I think that you, you probably did the, you know, I do these hop samplers all the time now, but you probably did. I was thinking this morning that uh, you were probably the originator of the hop sampler because you sent us, like a six pack of uh, or an assortment of, of beers yeah. that you brewed with, you know, single hop. And you, I think you each of those were, you know, six pack brews. Uh, that was, that was the first, um, the first time I was on the show. I think, I think I just emailed you to say, Hey, your small batch brewing or whatever had inspired me to do that. Um, I, I went about probably the, the most annoying way possible. I made five gallons of wort and then like individually boiled five, oh. one gallon of it, like six times. <laughs> That was uh, that was a long day. <laughs> well, I did. No, but we, we still do that kind of thing at the brewery. We ah. will steal uh, five gallons of uh, of an IPA before we dry hop it with whatever the plan is, and then hey, use uh, Strata or use uh, Sabro or use HBC four seven whatever. Um, you know, it's we're trying to still still learn like that. You know, that's how how you keep making great beer and stay relevant is not just do the same thing over and over and over again. Small batches for the win. <laughs> yeah. And and it's fun having a tasting room because then it's not just the us us trying it, but we can put it on tap and um, people can come in and, and see if they like it and, you know, learn something. And, you know, so we have, we have a lot of um, regulars who are home brewers or, or uh, even other local brewers who come here to, you know, try something out and, and not have to go through the, the hoops of brewing it themselves. If someone is going to make one of these big old, uh, either English, whatever you want to call it, uh, yeah. imperial stouts, what are the keys that uh, that they've got to think about 
uh, either if they're formulating their own recipe or if they're looking at somebody else's recipe? Sure. I mean, one of the things that, that depending on your setup, may be an issue is mash tun capacity. Mm. Uh, when we opened the, you know, we were thinking our biggest beer would be, you know, 1085, 1090 maybe, um, and making these beers that are 1120, 1130. I mean, a lot of these, the places doing the, the stats that people really are, are seeking after are starting at 1140, 1150 even. Um, and, you know, just a regular size mash tun that's, you know, uh, for a home brewer doing a five gallon batch, a, you know, a 10 gallon mash tun, something like that may not be big enough. Um, what we do, um, I'm sure other breweries do something similar, is we um, do two mashes for one boil. Hmm. Uh, and so rather than um, you know, getting all of our wort with a sparge and getting it into the kettle and boiling it all together, we'll um, get about, um, for a 10-barrel batch, get about seven barrels of wort into the kettle, start the boil, and then while that's going on, we'll do the second batch and the second runoff um, into the kettle and end up doing about a four-hour boil. Yeah. And even with that, we are often adding um, a bag of malt extract or a bag of uh, or or a, a thing of candy syrup or something else that will allow us to boost the gravity without having to wring more um, uh, extract out of our our grain. Um, yeah, there's as a, a hope brewer, yeah, there's a ceil- there's a ceiling on efficiency. I mean, you're. I mean, we talked about I talked about it uh, with Chris Colby on the show before. If you're you know, you can't put twice as much grain in your mash tun with the same amount of water and yeah. expect to get twice the fermentables out. <laughs> you, yeah. you know, with a big beer like this, you're going to have to collect basically two, you know, maybe two beers worth of of wort and then boil it down to, you know, one beer's worth of volume uh, to get exactly. your, your numbers up. Yeah. And and so that's, I mean, that's the, sort of the first thing to consider is just with your setup, you know, how much grain is the most grain you can put in? Um, honestly, I mean, even even at this scale, there's nothing wrong with malt extract. Malt extract, um, you know, particularly in a beer that's so driven by specialty malts, um, I really don't notice much difference. And and even I've heard from some breweries that uh, have gotten bigger systems and didn't have to use malt malt extract anymore. Um, actually, found that they were missing out on whatever flavor they were getting from the malt extract, or maybe the hmm. more concentrated boil you're getting, um, more Maillard reactions. Um, I know that that's a, a move at home I'd stolen from uh, Hair of the Dog in Portland, Oregon, who does some of the best, um, big, strong, interesting beers uh, in the country. They'll often boil down below their target volume and then water back um, just to allow them to really concentrate the sugars and the proteins and, and get more of those reactions. Huh. Um, but yeah, and then then the question is um, base malt. I'm I'm a big fan of Maris Otter and Golden Promise in um, – in bigger, darker beers, um, you wouldn't think that um, a slightly toastier base malt would make much of a difference, but it really adds this surprising depth to the flavor you get from the roasted malts. Um, early on, when I was helping Modern Times out with their uh, Black House Stout uh, recipe, we tried a version with uh, Maris Otter as the base that was head and shoulders above the previous one we'd done with American Two Row. Um, they just had this depth of cocoa, chocolatey, coffee kind of flavors with the same specialty malts and everything. Um, and it took some tweaking, and we ended up adding some um, biscuit malt, a few other things to kind of um, mimic that flavor. But as a home brewer, um, you know, using a, a base of a, a good quality English uh, pale malt, or I'm sure, you know, I, I haven't done many of the, the pale ale malts that you could get from an American uh, maltster, um, but that would be another good option, too. And if you're if you're boiling for a longer time, you know those those differences are going to maybe show up uh, more than than you know like a standard uh, boil length. You know with a with a paler uh, malt. Yeah. Or, you know. Yeah, and, and and you're also just with these big beers, you're adding so much more total malt than you would that. I mean, for me with a with a barley wine, you really don't need much specialty malt because you're adding so much high quality base malt that that really ends up being a, uh, a, a much more uh, impactful ingredient than if you were making a, a 1040 bitter where there's, you know, maybe eight pounds of, um, you know, Maris Otter versus the Imperial Stout that you might be adding 20 pounds of Maris Otter. Well, there's a lot to think about. And these are, these are tricky. These can be tricky uh, beers to brew. Yeah, um, no, it's, and, and so, yeah, it's, it, to me, it's, you know, high quality ingredients, um, watching the the pH of your mash, um, you know, being ready to add baking soda, 
Um, I love uh, uh, chloride is, is great for mouthfeel and body and, and um, enhancing sort of the roundness of, of a beer like that. A little sodium doesn't hurt. I'd keep the gypsum low. I would keep, um, I don't think you need much magnesium or anything like that, but um, yeah. And, and then, you know, being able to generate all that wort, you know, plenty of oxygen, plenty of yeast um, for sort of the cleaner um, American, you know, giant stouts. We just use USO5. Hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's reliable, it's, um, uh, great, great attenuation. It's, uh, relatively inexpensive, you know, compared to using that much liquid yeast or having to grow up a starter. Um, and yeah, we, we have had consistent, reliable fermentations from it, even, you know, up to, you know, 11% alcohol and, and we haven't tried it, uh, past that. Wow. Well, excellent. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, and it's, it's good to get together and, and, you know, let's, let's not wait until another 18 months to uh, do it again. Yeah. Hopefully we can uh, get you up to the brewery at some point once this, uh, this all calms down and travel becomes a, uh, a normal thing and we can, uh, you know, uh, brew something or blend something or just uh, drink something. I would love it. I would love all that. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Thanks, James. Uh, pleasure as always. Well, thanks again to Mike. Be sure to check out the Mad Fermentationist blog at themadfermentationist.com. And, of course, uh, check out Mike's book on brewing American sour beer. And if you're in the Columbia, Maryland area, stop by and see him and Scott Janish at Sapwood Cellars. If you have brewing uh, brewing questions, show suggestions, disaster stories, or just want to say hi... Write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form at basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Dodson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long.